Okay, it looks like we have let in everybody who is waiting. So I think we will get started. And if I can ask, um, if I can ask everyone who is here to mute themselves just at the get-go, that would be great. Um, I want to welcome everyone. I'm Emily Zilber. I'm the Director of Curatorial Affairs and Strategic Partnerships at the Eschrick Museum. I'm so excited for you to join us today for the talk with Holly Gore. I'll introduce Holly in just a moment. Um, first, I just want to hope that you'll join us for some upcoming virtual programs. There's always, always good stuff on our calendar. Uh, March 26th at noon will be our next free spotlight talk, which will focus on Eschrick's cast iron Washington printing press in celebration of the museum's upcoming in-print exhibition featuring high school printmakers. On April 8th at 3, I'll be chatting in our next curator conversation with Mary Savig, who's the Lloyd Herman Curator of Craft at the Renwick Gallery, and we'll talk about Eschrick's work in the context of the Renwick's collection and exhibitions um, from the gallery's founding to today. And specifically, um, the Renwick has a 50th anniversary in 2022, just like the Eschrick Museum does. And so we'll be talking a little bit about that milestone. Um, today's talk is a really exciting one. I'm so pleased to welcome Holly Gore for the conversation today. Holly is a PhD candidate in art history at the University of California, Santa Barbara specializing in modern and contemporary art with a focus on American craft. Her current research focuses on the intersections of modernist art and design with skilled manual labor. Um, her dissertation, Reinventing Work, Modernist Wood and Skilled Trade, 1930 to 1970, investigates 20th century artists and designers as they use their performance of woodworking as a means to enact American citizenship. So really exciting work that she's doing. Her 2013 MA thesis, Organic Form and the Functional Woodworks of Wharton Eschrick was completed at Stanford University and is a really smart and nuanced exploration of Eschrick's organicism in context. In fall 2019, Holly was a Furniture Society resident writer at the Aramont School for Arts and Crafts, and as a 2017-2018 Wingate Curatorial Fellow at the Asheville Art Museum, she curated the multimedia exhibition Crafting Abstraction. Prior to beginning her academic career, uh, Holly was a practicing cabinet maker and woodworker, so she really has an amazing range of expertise that she's bringing to her scholarly research that she's doing. Um, so I'm going to open things up for our conversation with Holly. I'll ask her some questions. We'll have a conversation for about a half an hour, and then we'll have about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes to, to, to have some conversation at the end. Feel free to put questions in the chat during the duration of our conversation. And at the end, we'll both look to the chat for questions. And, um, you know, if, if, if it seems if it seems like it's going with the flow of the program, folks can, can feel free to unmute themselves to ask questions as well. Um, so Holly, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm really happy to be here and to kind of return to the site of my master's thesis research. Well, it's, it's great to have you back, even if it is from uh, California <laughs> to here. Um, you know, I, I love it just before we, we sort of talk about the, the research that, that, you're, that you've worked on and that you've been working on. I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit more about your background, what brought you to craft and design scholarship and to woodworking in particular. Okay. Well, you know, I always feel like my work has kind of one foot in contemporary art and one foot in, um, in craft scholarship. Um, I went to college at the Cooper Union in New York City. I trained in painting, but then decided not to become an artist. And um, after college, I decided I wanted to, I just got interested in woodworking really as a skill to learn, but it ended up being a way that I made a living for almost 20 years. Um, I, I worked in uh, cabinet making for about five years. I worked for a company that built spiral staircases um, and then for a long time, I worked at um, the Canner Art Center at Stanford. It's the uh, museum on the Stanford campus um, as an exhibition builder and designer and managed the woodworking shop there. Um, and while I was there, it was really my, um, I think my interactions with artists and art and kind of seeing 
how contemporary artists used kind of research um, in br bringing, bringing kind of research into their work to kind of um, confront and kind of deal with contemporary issues. And I, that was really exciting to me. And, you know, I knew I didn't want to be an installation artist, but um, I was interested in writing. And so that's where I, um, I decided to go back to school. And so I, Stanford had a program um, a master's program of masters of liberal arts that you could do at night. It was designed for people who worked. So that's where I got started. Um, and so, yeah, I kind of have this interest in craft because that's what I practiced. Um, and then, you know, when I started looking into research on woodworking, I found that, um, you know, in modern craft studies, there was a lot of really great, exciting new scholarship um, coming out right at the time that I was starting to look at this maybe 10 years ago, um, but that woodworking had really received comparably less attention than things like ceramics or fiber. Um, and so, you know, in addition to being what, you know, a, a kind of a practice I, I knew something about technically, um, it was also just an area that I felt like was really rich for all kinds of scholarship and uh, it really, you know, um, I wanted to, sh to shine some light on that, so. That sounds like a really perfect confluence of, of skill and background and need because, because I, I think you're absolutely right. It, woodworking has been relatively understudied in, in relationship to a lot of other uh, media specific practices. Yeah. I mean, hearing, hearing, hearing that you work specifically on spiral staircases gives me an idea of what might be the answer to, <laughs> to a question of how you came to know about Warden Asherick and, and the Asherick Studio. And, um, you know, I'd love if you could talk about what your experience was as a researcher on the site while you were working on, um, on your master's thesis. Yeah, so um, when I was working at Stanford, um, I had a, a coworker um, who had been a charter subscriber to Fine Woodworking Magazine, had all the old issues from you know the mid 1970s. And one day, just as just for fun, he brought a whole stack of them and put them on my desk. And I would you know be eating my sandwich at lunch and looking through these magazines. And that's where I first saw um, photographs of the Escherich House and the staircase. And I thought, wow, that's you know that's really adventurous. And just you know, I always felt like the work. I did it for the stair building company was very kind of technically exciting. Um, we did a lot of kind of big uh, like vacuum form projects and, you know, uh, laminating. And I always, I always found it to be kind of more, actually a lot more adventurous than, than cabinet making was, but I looked at this stuff and thought, wow, where does this stuff get to exist? You know, where, you know, what kind of, what kind of ideas support this? Where, you know, where does, it, where, where is this? Does it even still exist? And so I started looking into it and, you know, sure enough, it was, um, you know, the Warden Ashrick Museum was, you know, as it, you know, in its similar form to what it is now. I think when I, in the, in the article I was reading about, it was really still kind of a family run, a small family run museum, still kind of a family home. And so it was interesting to see the, the evolution that it continues to go on. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm curious if you can talk a, a little bit about um, what some of the most important ideas that you engaged during your time um, writing about Eshrick were and, and especially how they might have set the stage for some of the work that you're, you're doing now, um, now that you're working on these much sort of bigger, deeper <laughs> research questions. Yeah. Well, coming to work at the Eshrick house, you know, it was a very kind of, immersive um, research experience. You know, it's very different from working in other kinds of archive, you know, an archive in a library or something where you really just have the folders full of materials. I mean, here I was sitting up, I was working up in the sleeping loft for those who've been in the house. Um, it was sort of an upstairs bedroom that was chock full of books and art and Escherich's own art, things that he collected. Um, and I think that that was a really kind of a unique opportunity to kind of see his things in the context of the time when he worked. I mean, it really was sort of like a little trip back in time to see all of his books and to understand that a lot of these books linked to people he knew. They were the, he knew the authors or they, you know, he was interested in, um, he was involved with the Anthroposophical Society in New York City and to see that he was reading about Rudolf Steiner or to see um, you know, his wife, uh, Letty Nofra Escherich was very involved with this kind of rhythmic dance and to see 
these pamphlets that he had designed and to read about this kind of dance and how it, you know they viewed it as kind of a very healthful thing, kind of like we might think of yoga. Um, and to kind of realize that he was really involved in these kind of ideals of kind of, you know, we call kind of alternative lifestyles. Um, and that's where I, I came to the focus of my master's thesis, which was this idea of this organic, that they were very concerned with these organic lifestyles. Um, and this is, um, you know, a sense of the word organic that's very different from the way we use it now. And that was that was really the focus of my um, of my project and looking at, I mean, it's basically, it's the idea that the human body is an organ, you know, we are organisms and we need to respect that. And, um, you know, they worried about the effects of modern life on the human organism that, you know, things like city living, time clocks, um, you know, automobiles, that this was all really kind of detrimental to the human organism. And, you know, you see a lot of this in progressive schools, um, in the dance that Letty practiced. I mean, the idea was that you were gonna get out of those little rooms and you were gonna free your body and, and, and you were gonna, you know, unleash your creativity. I mean, it was kind of this, uh, so there's, and I think a, probably a, one of the most succinct kind of written expressions of this I found was in a book by Ford Maddox Ford who came to visit the Escherichs in the 1930s. And you know, he talks about Wharton Escherich working in his studio um, and doing this very rhythmic kind of work. Like he's planing and it's, you know, he's pushing the plane in a rhythmic way that goes with, you know, the speed of a, of a human being's body. Um, and then he's pulling prints on the, you know, on the printing press. And again, this kind of repetitive, almost like, you know, your heartbeat is setting the pace. Now it's negligible. I think it's up for grads whether he actually saw that, but this is the, this is a lot of this ideal of, you know, the human body as this kind of, um, it's where all the vitality comes from. It needs to be, you know, you need to eat whole food. So Ford Maddox Ford gets very excited about the house that you know Letty and Wharton live live in. It, everything is handmade, but also that all of the food has been grown in the garden. And he goes into this really funny kind of rant about how you know these mass workers in the cities eat canned peas, and that it's it's a dullness, and that it's going to make it's going to make their minds dull. Um, and so I think when you you know when I look back at you know Wharton Eshrick's you know stairway with its kind of like this very unbounded, very physical, it's not going to be confined to anything more anything more regular than the body needs to walk up and down it. That that it becomes very declarative, and I think in a way that really links to that particular time. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so that's maybe we could take a look at the the stairway. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. I think what's 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 especially interesting about that is, um, gosh, how relevant that seems <laughs> in our past year as we're all figuring out these new ways of work, and um, they certainly uh, shift our our bodies and um, require us to, yeah. to be in different kinds of of contexts that are maybe not so conducive to to the way we exist as organisms in the world. So um, yeah, it's it's it there feel it feels like there's some parallels there. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the kind of analogy I used to use for this is that people worry about screen time, you know, about, mm -hmm. about kids being put in front of the screen. But you're right, Emily, like in this past year, it's screen kind of time's got nothing on the pandemic. It's, you know, it's just, yeah. I mean, I was reading, I, I can't remember where I was, if it was in New York Times or where, someone talking about, you know, is your body achy from, you know, the pandemic? And <laughs> if I asked for a show of hands, I think, I think everybody would probably. <laughs> would probably raise them. <laughs> so we've we've got the got this the staircase here. I'm curious if there are things that that specifically you wanted to to point out um uh connected to sort of these ideas that you're that you're that you talked about in in the thesis work. Um well, I think with looking at, you know, well, first of all, with coming to visit the studio, I mean, I was really impressed with just the way this stairway, I mean, the stairway tunnels down below into the basement, it goes up, it branches, it, it attaches to another kind of stairway that's made out of railroad ties. So this is just a, a section of it. Um, and 
you know, it's almost as if, it feels almost as if parts of the house are built around the stairway. I know they're probably not, but it really has a feeling of some kind of, um, a, a kind of an, you know, like a tree that kind of grows from within. It's got this great um, kind of twisted central column and then these um, treads that splay out and each one is a little different from the others and they're cut with an ax. So there's just this kind of wonderful kind of very, I think very physical feeling mm -hmm. to it. Um, you know, and of course it's very kind of masculinized labor. Um, but I think, you know, there's really a sense of kind of when you're walking, it's really, it, it's, it's really kind of a spatial experience to walk on it because, um, especially when you're kind of hopping from one section to the other, that there's a, you know, there's a really a, a kind of, I think a lot of people I've heard talking about it have mentioned dance in some way, because it really is about human movement. Mm. Um, so, um, yeah, so I mean, I think it was um, uh, a kind of a sense, you know, a sense of, um, you know, in one sense, you could just read this as a kind of, you know, arts and crafts masculine labor, but I think also when considering the, the interactions that Escherich had with, with dance and with these other ideas that mm. I think we can see it in a really kind of like a 20th century um, way. That's so interesting, and it and it and it gives me a really um, a good sense of the pathway. I think from the work that you were doing at the Escherich House to your current research, which is, um, you know, has these ideas around the nature of work, the performance of work. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you can if you can tell us, a, you know, a little bit more about the the research that you're working on now, the thesis of the of the current dissertation and the way that you're thinking about woodworking as a medium that's sort of integ integrally connected to this idea of work. Yeah, so, you know, when I think when I was at, when I was looking, when I was doing my Escherich research, I mean, I was, one of the things I noticed is that, you know, his, his uh, home and studio, it's almost like a, a catalog of these kind of valorizations of work. Mm. And maybe we could look at some of them. Yeah. We Next Absolutely. Um, and so these are just some some little details from the house. Um, and on one side, uh, a cat. This is a cabinet that he made. One of the few pieces that I think he did all of the joinery on himself with a lot of technical advice from his um, neighbor John Schmidt. And you know, I was very impressed with it when you see it in person. That you really see all of the little gouges of the tool that is making this um, sculpture, uh, this kind of carved relief, but also if you look very closely, the kind of the little tiny pins that are, wood pins that are holding together the pieces of wood. Um, and it's a very, it's a very arts and crafts idea that you really see the, the work of the craftsmen. Um, that's sort of celebrating the fact that there was someone sitting there laboring at this. Um, and then the other image is, is kind of a little self-portrait of Wharton Eschrick as a sculptor. And it's one of a row of pegs that he did of the workmen who built the house. So these kinds of valorizations of, of this kind of manual work that's, it's physical, but it's also very creative. Mm. And then maybe we could see the next one. Yeah. And that, yeah, so here the hammer handle chairs again, celebrating kind of masculine work with these, you know, these implements of work. And um, then uh, on the other, and the other image is a, um, a plate from a book, a woodcut that Eschrick did of um, Walt Whitman's poem, Song of the Broad Axe. And, you know, you can see this, this is a very kind of idealized version of a person working outside, they're in nature. Um, they don't, they appear to be sort of working on their own time. Um, and the entirety of this poem has to do with um, the idea of Americans as sort of self-made workers um, who are in the, the uh, ax men or lumberjacks are felling the trees that are going to make way for the great cities. So it's this whole idea of, you know, American progress and advance that is really um, driven by this kind of really physical self-determined labor. So it's a kind of, it's a, it's an idea of, of 
America, but it's really founded in these kind of um, um, valorizations of work that I think run uh, that I think run through a lot of woodworking and a lot of the ar artists who I've been studying in my dissertation project. Mm. Yeah. So actually, if we can go to the next, we can move to the yeah, absolutely. So, so th this is uh, so my dissertation. Um, investigates modernist woodworkers who, where uh, work for work is actually itself the medium. Um, so they're inventing new modes of work um, and that are at the same time as they are producing objects. Um, and so one of my case studies is um, woodworking at Black Mountain College. Um, so Black Mountain College was um, a progressive college in um, North Carolina that existed from 1933 until 1957. And it was, it was founded as a progressive school, uh, but became a very, um, uh, very well known as an art school actually, where a lot of famous modernists went. Joseph Albers taught there. Um, the first happening supposedly was there. Uh, Ruth Asawa trained there. So, but it was also it was it was also a liberal arts college. So it wasn't just a um, an art school. And one of the amazing things about Black Mountain College is that during the early 1940s they decided to build their own campus and they decided to use student labor to do this. And that this was um, you know part of the idea of progressive schools was that you train the whole person again. It's going back to this very organic ideal of the of the of the individual organism needing to be uh, nurtured rather than trained. So you weren't going to have grades. You know you were going to have more like a just kind of community building. Um, you needed to, the idea was that you needed to educate social people and people who are really it was really very pro democracy. It was education for citizenship. Um, and so this is what the images on this uh, I'm showing, this is a page spread from one of their um, uh, advertisements, one of their um, brochures. And you can see it's all people working outside. They're, um, they're building their buildings. So they're breaking the rocks. Uh, they're digging the ditches to drain. This was kind of a swampy ground. So they, they drain the ditches. And I think in one of them, kind of on the lower right, they're they're kind of taking a coffee break outside. So it's this kind of real rugged, uh, you know, education. They said, you know, this is this is great. This is um, this is takes the place of physical education. It teaches leadership. It teaches community responsibility. Um, and it, actually, they had a work camp over the summer where you could send your kids just to do this. <laughs> 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 That's so, <great. laughs> so the work I'm doing on, on Black Mountain College is focuses on a woman named Molly Gregory, mm -hmm. who taught woodworking at Black Mountain College, um, and who arrived just as this building project was wrapping up and they were getting ready to move into this, these new buildings and they needed furniture and they needed to panel the insides and they needed to keep people kind of motivated for this kind of, you know, self-determined lifestyle that they decided to have. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe can we see the next one? Yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, so there's Black, there's the Black Mountain College Studies Building and their Black Mountain College Bulletin and then there's another construction shot. And these are pretty much all faculty and students with the guidance, you know, very much like Wharton Escherich worked with the guidance and, and help from his neighbors. They had, um, they had local tradesmen that they had hired to, to help them, but they were really doing most of the, the really hard physical work. Um, mm -hmm. So, and so uh, maybe the next, next slide, right there, there she is. <laughs> so um, Molly Gregory is shown here. She's um, crouching and talking with someone and this is the woodworking shop that she ran at Black Mountain College. She and another student actually built the entire building. Um, they built the workshop, they set it up and this is where she gave woodworking classes. Actually Ruth Asawa studied here um, and uh, it was, you know, it was really um, an ideal of community, community service that they were, that, and this was really at the heart of their curriculum. Curriculum. So Molly Gregory's not actually that well known, but this is, um, you know, really very central to the ideal of Black Mountain College was that it was this experiment with democracy, um, and that's what I'm finding was that woodworking was really. Um, 
it was a very central activity um, in that. And it was, um, they were producing objects, but they were also producing, you know, really producing citizens was the ideal. Mm. And so, so I'm curious um, if you can talk a little bit more in some of the other case studies in the thesis, how um, citizenship gets configured in other kinds of ways, um, because I know it, it must be a different conversation within the context of um, uh, some of the other folks that you're focusing on. Yeah, so I, I have three case studies. There's Molly Gregory at Black Mountain College. There's um, Isama Noguchi, and I'm looking at the um, stage sets that he made for Martha Graham. I think a lot of people don't think of Isama Noguchi so much as a woodworker, um, but he really did some really, really very fantastic, inventive kind of furnishings um, mm. for productions. Um, and also I'm looking at George Nakashima, uh, the very well-known American studio furniture maker. Um, and I think, you know, all three, all three of these artists um, came of age around the 1930s um, was when they started working. This was the Depression era. It was not the most auspicious time to start a career in art, but it was also, it was a time, you know, this is going back to a time before the United States was really acknowledged as any kind of an art center. Mm -hmm. um, it was still thought of as very provincial. You know, it wasn't until really the 1950s that New York becomes this kind of, you know, known as this world art center. And so in the art, art and design, I think there was a lot of, um, you know, if you think WPA murals, there was a lot of effort, really self-conscious effort at making an American art. And in order for artists to get a foothold in a lot of these kind of art worlds was they had to be able to represent America mm -hmm. either, I, I mean, I think both in maybe the subject matter or their design, mm -hmm. but also in their person. So this made it very difficult for people of color to, um, and particularly Japanese Americans to, um, get a foothold because people did not want to accept their art as, American. And so my, um, my research shows that actually woodworking was a really, um, a really fertile place for people to be able to do this. And, um, you know, uh, Isama Noguchi ended up, you know, making the sets for these really important works of modern dance. This is really when a modern dance comes on the world stage as a very uniquely American art. Um, and then, you know, George Nakashima is you know, an acknowledged seminal kind of practitioner of American studio furniture. So I'm looking at how woodworking was really a place of opportunity for, for and also for Molly Gregory. I mean, as a woman, um, you know, she was not going to be able to access these ideals of progressive education of leadership and mm. citizenship because, you know, outside of school, I mean, women, you know, they weren't really expected to do that so much it was more like consumers <laughs> than, than citizens. So. Absolutely, absolutely. That, that's that's it's fascinating, and I'm I'm excited to see <laughs> to see where 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 that leads. Um, you know, I I think it's really interesting that within the context of this research, you can make these connections between um, woodworking as a you know we often think of woodworking or studio furniture as a practice that's kind of bounded within craft or within tradition, and you're really um, you know showing how it's relevant to the 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 sort of um, birth of of the U.S. as a contemporary art center to our identity um, to our artistic identity in 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 the U.S. Um, you know I'm curious if how thinking more broadly about contemporary art, contemporary practice, and, you know, craft and wood all in context, um, impacts the way that you think about craft's history, how it's written, how we sort of view works of art from the past, how we approach archives. Well, you know, I'm always, I, 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 like I said before, I always feel like I have one foot in craft and one in, in contemporary art, and I find um, I mean, I found in the work I'm doing right now, like right, you know, kind of at this moment, I'm writing a, a my dissertation chapter on on um, Nakashima, mm -hmm. and I'm finding that you know actually, you know, it's interesting to see what other scholars have said, but it's also very useful to see what artists have said about you know um, the experience of internment, and so you know, I'm writing about um, you know some works by uh, artists. Uh, Wendy Nakashima, uh, sorry, Wendy Mariyama, who, mm -hmm. who has created 
Um, and she's a woodworker, but she's also created contemporary art. She kind of works on the on the edge there, and that she's created some works on the experience of um, internment, in particular a cabinet. I'm writing about a cabinet called Manzanara that, on the outside, it's it looks very much like a very lovely, beautifully crafted cabinet. But then on the inside, you can, when you slide it open, the back is um, the back panel is embossed with these scenes of Manzanara, and you see that actually these kind of horizontal proportions that it have is actually it's, it's because it's framing this kind of American panorama. And so looking at, you know, the kinds of ideas that brings up of, you know, how these, this uh, experience of internment has been really kind of closeted away. Mm. Um, and, you know, again, artists using, using a craft to kind of address, you know, contemporary, you know, issues that have contemporary relevance. Yeah, absolutely. I think once you once you are sort of working outside of those boundaries, you're much more in line with what artists are doing regardless, right? <laughs> um, which makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I know you're really singularly focused on your dissertation at the moment, but I'm curious if there are any topics or artists that you haven't been able to fully explore through this project that might guide whatever comes on the other side of mm -hmm. the dissertation. And of course, you know, I think we all we all hope it um, it's publication. Well, there's a, there are a couple, you know, the dissertation sort of leaves off at the 1960s and 70s. And I, you know, I sort of it just kind of hit, comes up to the um, kind of countercultural era. era era of the Bay Area and woodworking then it kind of it just kind of stops there. So I, I think that would be an area that I would like to research more. Um, I could also see doing an exhibition on um, Japanese design in the United States. I think there's um, looking at Japanese American designers, but also how they're working with and against kind of uh, Western tastes for Japanese design. I think that's something that um, I think could could span actually a lot of media. It could be uh, woodworking, the fashion, it could be art. I mean, it could come, it could go back to the 19th century or come right up to the present. Well, I hope that you have the opportunity to do that because <laughs> I would like to see that show. And I, <laughs> I hope that there's a great museum that gives you a lot of space <laughs> to work on and, and explore that. Um, Thank you so much, Holly, for, for taking us through this, this sort of wonderful overview of, um, you know, the different, oh, oh, we just, we, oh. before I, before we, before we open it up for questions, is that, do we want to talk about, we, we left a, left, leave no slide behind. <laughs> sure, just, just very quickly, this is a, this is a design, um, the, the, in the photograph, you can see a, a kind of a bowl plate. It's a square kind of panel with a lathe turned scoop in it. And that's, this was a design that Molly Gregory created for her students to make. Mm. Um, and so they would make these typically as gifts or um, for fundraising. And they, she would even orchestrate these kind of little parties where they would make, the, they would make these, she would get the students together. And this was a period where there were a lot of girls were there because it, a lot of the men had been drafted during World War II. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so they would make, they would get together and they would make these and then they would have a, a party and Molly Gregory would make all kinds of nice food and then they would eat with the plates or with the cutlery and then they would give these things as a gift. And she really, I mean, she really orchestrated these as these kind of community um, building events. And I mean, keep in mind, these people were in nor rural North Carolina. So they really, the ability to self entertain was, <laughs> again, we can probably all relate a little bit now. It was, it was important. <laughs> um, and just on the, on, on the other side is a, this is a letter home that a student um, had, had written um, to her, her boyfriend. And actually you can see she's done a little watercolor sketch in the margin of the Molly mm. Curry bowl and described the bowl making event. So. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. And, and, and is this material is all, um, uh, are you, there's archives at Black Mountain that you're working with for this material? So Black Mountain College is now a, a boy, a boys camp. Yeah. Um, so you can get it once a year. They let people in to come and see the buildings or what's left of them. This is all at the North Carolina State Archive, which is okay, a great. really great, really great resource um, for, for Black Mountain College. Yeah. That's fabulous. I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah, that's really wonderful. All right, I wanna make sure that we have time 
time for for questions. So I'm gonna uh, see if there's anything in the in the chat. But I'm hoping that that people also feel free to unmute themselves if they have questions and ask um, things directly to to Holly. We have a question here, Holly. If you've public if the the about any published material related to the work that you've done on Ashrick. So I have not published anything on Escherich. Um, I'm in, I'm hoping to um, roll in some of the work from the thesis into my dissertation. I think in the introductory section, it'll be more of a, an introduction to woodworking or modernist woodworking. Um, so I'm and I'm hoping to publish that. So yeah, forthcoming. I hope. <laughs> <laughs> if I could make an offering. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Hi, Rob. <laughs> yeah, Rob, right here. Uh, Holly, I was pleased to hear you mention Ford Maddox, Ford's visits to Escher. Yeah. And I don't know if you came across this in your readings, but Bob Bascom, Escherich's son-in-law, shared with me an experience Ford Maddox, Ford mentioned, that he said he was sitting across the studio, sort of observing Warden at work. Uh -huh. And Ward, Warden said, Ford, come here a minute. And he brought me over to the other side of the studio said close your eyes and he put my hand on the piece that he was working on and said just run your hand along this and Ford Maddox Ford said I just my hand just wanted to go where that piece took it I just became one with the piece uh -huh. I don't know if that's in his writings anywhere or not uh, well just in in um in the great trade route which is which what I read where he he had written about Eshrick I think um, Escherich's friend Theodore Dreyer had sent him to write about Escherich. Mm -hmm. um, he was very, I mean, he came across as being very absolutely enamored with mm -hmm. the studio and the house and the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, but I did read somewhere in some of Escherich's letters that he actually had asked for to leave. I guess he had sort of overstayed his welcome a little bit too much. <laughs> I didn't hear that version. <laughs> he said that, yeah, Ford, was, he was traveling with, with his um, partner, Janice Biala, who was a painter, and that he had asked Ford and Biala to leave because they were, he loved them, but they were just too much. <laughs> <laughs> Holly, we have a really interesting question about, um, uh, the idea of woodworking as understudied relative to other crafts and and your your thoughts on why why that is where why it's taken a little bit longer for woodworking to get the kind of same kind of academic um attention well i mean there are a couple reasons i could come up with i think one you know uh some of the scholarship has been around bauhaus and bauhaus really um you know, woodworking was not a full-fledged discipline there. It was kind of a helper to architecture. Um, and certainly that's, I think that's how Joseph Albers treated it at Black Mountain College. Joseph Albers was a former professor from the Bauhaus. And I think that's how a woman like Molly Gregory was able to get in and teach mm. this because they said, well, this is just kind of a helper thing. This isn't its own discipline. Um, and I think also, you know, a lot of the work in I've seen in ceramics and fiber has had a lot to do with looking at what women were doing during the mid-century because women were just all but excluded from painting and, and sculpture. And I think, you know, there certainly were women in woodworking, but it's maybe not the first person you look if you're looking for, you know, women. So that's that's just kind of speculation on my part. Mm. Know, two very two possible reasons <laughs> yeah i mean i it's in my mind i felt part of part of the reason i've always thought um is the fact that uh in terms of the widespread development of academic programs bfa programs mfa programs um certainly you have them for furniture fiber ceramics but in terms of like wood turning and other kinds of woodworking um they're less less available, less accessible, and and mm -hmm. and where we codify things in academia, so <laughs> so people who research follow. That's always been been sort yeah. of one of my understandings of it. Mm -hmm. um, questions here about the any potential collaboration between Eshrick and Nakashima, given their given their proximity to one another. I I don't imagine you found anything in. <laughs> Research. So I was that. on another another one of these Zoom events, Emily, and you were on this, and I I think it was Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Yes. Mira Nakashima was on, and someone yes. asked a very similar question. Yep. And Mira Nakashima said that um, they had met 
um, but that they didn't they didn't hit, hit it off. I think she's, no. <laughs> she, yeah, they just are very different, very different people, very different values. So kind of I interesting, uh, but that that they were doing, you know, that they were working such a similar genre so close together, but no, not not friends. <laughs> Um, so I'm interested, you know, question here about um, any relationship between what the Shakers were doing, and and I, and actually that that makes me think. Um, have have as you've been sort of doing this research, have you been thinking about other sort of ideas of work in different kind of communities like the Shakers say that go back a little further as a way to sort of set the stage for how you're thinking about work um, uh, in the dissertation. So, you know, the taste for shaker furniture becomes huge starting in the 1920s, um, you know, prominent New Yorkers are start collecting it um, and they're very interested in this new Lebanon furniture um, that's very and also very functional work. They're very interested in things like sewing cabinets and um, you know, really prizing these objects because they have these really functionally determined details. It's not decorative of something sort of inventive. It's a kind of a, an inventive, you know, driven by the need for function. Um, and this taste, I think, you know, I, I think for for sure this, um, you know, comes into looking at Eshrick furniture with this kind of simplicity, uh, interest in these kind of, um, exposed furniture details, um, Nakashima, um, all of it. And I mean, a lot of people have, have likened Molly Gregory's work to the Shakers too. So I think that the modernists were really looking to that. But that said, I, I don't think that they were actually very interested, you know, they were not interested in the Shaker religion. So they were really taking it someplace else. And I think one sort of interesting detail I found was that there was a, a chair that the Shakers had made that had, it had these kind of, um, like a little hardware detail where it was like a ball bearing kind of thing so that you could lean the chair back. You know, if you're picture you're at the table and you're gonna lean back after dinner um, and the little ball bearing makes it lean without, you know, damaging the chair. Um, and that, you know, people looking back later said that's ridiculous. The shakers would never have been leaning back in their chairs and that this was sort of something marketed to, to connoisseurs of, of shaker furniture. Um, but because it was this functional detail that people loved, um, but you know, really kind of a, a myth that <laughs> <laughs> it didn't didn't quite go with 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 the larger um, you know yeah. belief system. Yeah, we've got time for one one more question, and I'm and I'm curious if we can. Um, I'm looking at Bruce's question here. This this notion of masculine strength shown in the work, and then the team work in the the sort of school campus and woodshop, and and thoughts you might have on individualistic or individualism versus kind of, uh, kind of cooperative work? Well, that was really the crux of Black Mountain College was, you know, I mean, this is, they were like, we're, this is the American ideal. Like we can all be, you know, citizens, like we preserve the, the, the rights of the individual with the needs of the collective. I mean that, and that's where, you know, Molly Gregory was really working at where the rubber meets the road because there are actually a lot of problems with that. I mean, there are people <laughs> Who would just say, I, you know, there are people who would say, I'm too busy, I don't want to do this, particularly faculty, because they could, but also because they were saddled with all these other kinds of administrative duties because the staff there was so slim. And so, yeah, there was a lot of um, friction there. And I've been able to go through the faculty meeting notes there, and there's a lot of conversation versus, you know, this this student is is taking on, you know, too much, too big of a role within the construction projects and not able to advance in their studies. And well, you know, kind of having to remind, I think the people who are really gung ho on these construction projects that you have actually students and that they have to, um, that you have to look out for their well being. And so it was really, it was really a tricky balance. And I feel like on a good day, they might've done it, um, you know, having people, um, you know, kind of benefiting from this um, uh, contribution to the collective in the, as advertised, but on a bad day, not so much. It was really like a lot of, you know, it was sort of the same old people getting stuck with all the work. Um, <laughs> you know. there, 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 are, there, are, there are group roles no matter where, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> where yeah. no, no matter where we look, regardless of uh, in, what, in what field, I think. <laughs> yeah. Holly, 
Thank you so much for, for taking this time with us today. Um, if folks have additional questions, feel free to reach out to us and we can um, uh, you know, continue the conversation. We'll send some um, a follow-up email that has a link to the program and also some links to some of the things that we've touched on today. Um, I wanna say thank you for being here. And I'm hoping we, we often do this at the end of these programs that uh, folks can unmute themselves and say a little goodbye while, um, uh, while we all jump off. But, but thank you so much, Holly. Thank you, everyone. And hopefully we'll see you at the next program. Thank you. Okay. Thank Thank you. you. Thanks, Holly. Very interesting. Thank Great you, Holly. Holly. Thank you, Holly. Thanks.